This is Ben Gillespie interviewing Sheila Pepe at her home in Brooklyn. It is August 25th, 2020, and this is the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art Pandemic Project. Sheila, could you tell me just a little bit about your life since March of 2020? Well, um, February 7th, uh, Carrie Moyer, my wife and sometimes collaborator, opened a show at the Portland Museum of Art in Maine called Tabernacles for Trying Time. So I was actually kind of taking some time off thinking, well, uh, I, I was teaching, actually when I was teaching a quarter, I mean, the sequencing is a little off, it's all a little blurry, but so the show was up and then suddenly the show was having to be cleaned oddly, and then the show was going to be closed, or the show was closed. And uh, when we came back from the show, I was like, I'll take a couple of weeks off. I'm going to teach a quarter at SBA, and I literally have nothing to do now. And we worked on this for like a couple of years. And so I was expecting to go back out into the world and start teaching, and suddenly I was having a real lockdown, not a kind of the myself, my first self-imposed lockdown. So it was a disappointment in, at first because I like wasted those two weeks doing nothing. <laughs> but it got very strange very quickly. Like we were early adopters uh, with the masks and the gloves and stuff, but it didn't help me from getting it. So I got um, a version of COVID in, um, I don't know when, it was like this, I, I taught the last class and I had to cancel the second to the last class because I was sick. So um, April, I'm guessing late April. And I, like one of the things that's happened is time is completely messed up. Like I don't know what day it is. I don't, you know, and um, I think getting COVID made me feel, um, I'm a, a little, um, agoraphobic because of it, even though like yesterday, I just came back from um, Portland where we deinstalled Tabernacles for Trying Times. Um, so as you can see, this kind of circuitous talking, which I usually do is even more circuitous than usual because I can't like, I can barely make a straight line in my thoughts and everything. So um, kind of embedded in this, um, uh, social space that's completely happening in a box or with earphones on or through my phone. Um, I think the Tabernacles project was, there was so much about it um, with this piece called Parlor for the People that was about bringing people into the museum and making it their space and the Parlor for the People was programmed really brilliantly by the folks at um, Portland and in Portland, this guy, Chris Adame, he's just, I had met when I had a show in Phoenix, he was there, now he's in Portland. Um, and they understood that we just wanted it to be a place where people gathered for whatever reason, it was definitely not art related. There was not a necessity. I think maybe there was one program or maybe two, but um, just like a big tent, like a place where people using the museum as a, as a kind of common house, um, but also knowing that ideas of spirituality and religion and you know, the way people um, are experiencing difference. There is some hopefulness like this could be a place where a lot of different people wouldn't, could meet. And often I think in museums, it is where a lot of different people meet because people come to art for radically different reasons. Um, you know, some are checking in on an asset they have. <laughs> And some are may make it so they don't you know they don't have any necessarily financial um, and some people just like it they, they just think it's fun to go to the museum and look at stuff um, so all of the like the common sense series which would include people knitting and deconstructing work all the things that were hands on and and really sought to transform the interactivity of a museum were out which was shocking because 
um, it just, in far as museums, it felt like it just pushed the museum back like 50 years, like no touching, no nothing, no, this is not a fun place for people. This is still, you know, a quiet place where people, the guards are all in uniforms and they put their hands behind their, um, you know, fold them behind their back and it, it's scornful and all that other stuff. So it was a shock. I mean, it was also just a shock to work on something that long and have it be closed. Luckily, they extended it and reopened it, which made me made us feel better. And then, interestingly, they didn't really have a super tech um, division of their education or or um, outreach. So they very quickly developed a lot of materials to go up online, which I thought was pretty amazing for such a small institution. Um, so there was a lot of living of it online through videos and social media and stuff. Um, but in general, the you know depopulation of the city, the getting sick, the masking, the looking at a lot of art online, doing crits online, and now you know being completely offended by it when it started that this is impossible. I'm doing a lot of it and it seems to be working out okay. And um, which gives me pause, but I think it's just my way of coping. It's a lot to take in. I mean, I haven't really made much. I'm working on parts of things for a new piece that I have um, a deadline for. And I wasn't making anything for a while. I, I was, um, I did a couple of interviews, one that will go to press, one, lots of things on line volunteering my time a lot working looking for work really in a crazy way um uh like suddenly realizing money might be an issue <laughs> um so a lot of um what i'd call like duck and cover activity a lot of the same feeling that i had right after 9 11 but there was nothing to see I think that's or smell or it was a it, it was completely invisible this COVID thing and it's also all over the world in these very strange and um, bizarre ways that um, really highlight the socioeconomic political worlds that we live in which I find quite fascinating. I mean then you know, finding out that mostly people in the city who were black and brown were dying, it was like, oh, that's it. That's the proof. That's crazy. And then Mr. Floyd died. And um, and we were, Carrie had just test, tested positive, but she was, you know, it was after I was recovering and had antibodies and she tested positive, but she's asymptomatic and we had to be super locked down. And so that's like the two weeks that most of the um, marches were and we couldn't go anywhere. So that was frustrating. And also another kind of alienating moment of having to stay inside in effort not to make anybody else sick, which is really, it's really strange. It's like, are you doing this so you don't get sick or so you don't get anybody else sick? That's a very, that it's like a Mobius strip that I think a lot about. But I think I've used the time to study a lot. I've read a lot of books, um, a lot about um, Black American history. I normally read a lot about world history and um, anthropology and um, a lot of science is one of my things, but um, ancient histories and then understanding how they relate to they're food for my work, but it's also food for understanding the roots of different, like understanding white supremacy through reading people like John Locke and, and other um, British um, individualists. And um, so, but, um, I'm looking at the founders and just doing a lot of work owning my whiteness and starting to really get better lenses uh, for me to see the world through this augmented subjectivity, 
which is embarrassing at best. Um, it's tragic, I mean, to understand what I grew up with in terms of thinking what was real and what was not real. Or, um, you know, I'm born in 59, so I'm the kid who, you know, sang amber waves of grain every morning at um, after the Pledge of Allegiance in my Girl Scout uniform. You know, we're Italian Americans who got as white as possible as soon as possible because my parents had a little bit of trouble. They were born in the 20s, so they were always afraid for us. Um, whether it was the Depression, being Italian, being Catholic, I don't really know what it was. Uh, maybe World War II, uh, the atomic bomb. Yeah, they were always afraid, and I never understood what they were talking about until now. It's an age thing, perhaps. Um, but so I'm spending a lot of time thinking and some time knitting and working and reading and reaching out to people who through zoom or skype or whatever it is that um some friends i have old skype relationships with so we stick to skype it's funny the um the ballooning of the um the online infrastructure and the loss of um, physicality is, it's depressed. I mean, I'm kind of depressed. I am depressed. I'm technically depressed, but I'm also feel probably um, with the election a little hopeless, but, um, but I, I'm not, didn't anticipate living in this world this point and there are times when I think about um, what I try to think about what the role of art is I mean it's really profoundly affected me so I I know it's probably the best thing I do <laughs> um, and but I don't have what I had before was this like incessant desire to like just push and push and push and you know, find another gig or do more, or I just think I have things coming up and I'll go much slower. And I like slower. I'm reminded that slower could be, I spend a lot less when I do slower, which is really interesting. Um, and, you know, I just need more stamina. I think I don't know how many people experience this, but one of the big, um, the big sort of after experiences of COVID is I, I still can't smell some things properly. Um, I'm not sure if that'll ever come back or, or and I taste things very differently. Like I used to hate oat milk in my coffee. Now I love oat milk in my coffee. Like I do this Are you sure thing. that's not just Brooklyn? No, I know. I mean, Carrie was oat milk and I was milk, cow milk. Um, but now I don't know why I like this better and other things like that. But um, <laughs> soy milk would be okay too, but I'm not supposed to eat that much soy. Almond milk, no. Almonds are for eating, I'm sorry, or cereal. But um, I'm really tired. Like I the fatigue aspect of it is and that's how it manifests my COVID was like not a it was like more like a really really bad, bad bronchitis but I slept like a, some might say I was in a coma but I thought it was sleeping for like two weeks straight like it just couldn't get up so I don't know why but now I just feel that way still and um it's getting better, like deinstalling was good exercise, but it's going to take some time for the physical part to be manifest in a meaningful way and not feel so um, um, reined in um, by what is and isn't happening out there. So funny how um, visibility, like the invisible is very daunting. Um, it's probably the, you know, the nuclear, the, you know, it's the 
this feels like the bomb of the 21st century. Like it's invisible, it could hurt you. And some people are building a bomb shelter and other people are like, oh, it's fine. You know, mask, no mask. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about the, so tabernacles for trying times and yeah. Um, and we see so many museums do this in different ways with different innovations of reimagining how to bring people together. And it always has to do with space. Like you get people in the same space, you can have a conversation and all of a sudden we can't be in the same space or if we can yeah. be in the same space, it's really mediated. Um, and so I guess I was, I was wondering a bit about that, but looking at the clock now, I think I'm going to ask my, my other question um, towards the end about so thinking about the temporality that you, you're describing um, and the fatigue and the slowing down of things, yeah. um, I also want to think about the, the speed of making things by hand um, and the sort of the inherent slowness of that and um, building large <laughs> things versus, so we have that, I feel like in my own home life and what I hear from others in isolation, it feels so slow. It feels like time is just unspooled but then we connect instantaneously on the internet and everything online feels like it's going a million miles an hour. Um, I've adapted to feeling like um, this is normal. Like this is normal. I'm like, I, I have a hard time having a regular phone call now. It's either text or this. It's like, why would you not see the face if you could, you know? Um, but I am, I, this is a lot like, you know, the summer of my childhood, summers of my childhood, where I was, um, by the time I was 10, both my siblings were out of the house and my parents were, you know, a bit older and, you know, had either working, cleaning house or doing something. And I was off on my own little private thing, building with blocks or coloring books or digging a hole on the outside. You know, like I spent hours by myself just thinking and making things so it i think for me i feel like it's the new normal but the old normal of like oh this is how time should go this is how it should pass so that you know on the other hand yeah making knitting something or knitting and crocheting something for a huge installation takes months and months of non-stop working i'm not doing that anymore I'm doing it a little and I'm watching a lot of Criterion channel and I have a new game on my phone that I play and then I stop and listen to a book, which is normally how I do it. And, um, and just sit and listen or, you know, knit or crochet and listen or, so it's, um, you know, I'll catch myself just staring out the back door or backyard or something like just doing trying to, I mean, I think it takes a tremendous amount of energy to understand how it is we are here, not just because of COVID and keep track of, I mean, we don't have any one reliable source or, you know, clearinghouse of information that doesn't feel completely politicized. So, and that may have always been true, but at least you had one place that was suspect in a particular way, and then other places you can compare with it, you know, not a million zillion things on the internet, and then, you know, seven newspapers you have to read, and then the White House, or not the White House, definitely not the White House, but however that goes, whatever you believe, um, it's, it's like that, it's like believe, it's not think anymore. <laughs> so um, it's definitely headspace, and um, and that's the kind of thing that can let me like work, like knowing something, being feeling sure or somewhat sure, wanting to try something out with a purpose, and knowing there'll be a convergence around it that's physical, because I've chosen to make physical things. There was a path when I was making video and I was like, no, I'm gonna make handmade things in the, nine, in the late 90s. Um, where I think um, 
yeah, that labor is, I don't know what that labor is about anymore. If it's just, it's really like, you know, the chopping down of the tree or the clapping or the whatever, it's very much of a, um, um, it's a, it's a, um, unnameable, there's, I can't answer the question. And it, in a way, I think that's very fruitful. I think it's a good time I, it to um, just go to the studio every day and act or act like it's normal for me would like blow my mind because I need a, a foundational set of pre, um, premise to work. Um, that is about community and people getting together to work and to engage and um, to touch things, literally to walk through things perhaps or um, we made these chairs and pillows and no touching, no pillows, no transfer. It's crazy. Um, I mean, it, and what it does is it takes the, for all the trouble that museums have seen lately, they're kind of my place because they, they are a public space. And with most cases, um, some kind of membership, it's really fairly inexpensive. I, ironically in place if you plan to go a lot. Um, so it seems like, a, well, in, in DC, they're all for free because they're all ours. But um, that idea that you, that it would be a kind of public forum for stuff and people who like stuff um, doesn't exist right now in the same way. I mean, this show is going to, um, a portion of this show is going to show up at the Museum of Art and Design in um, New York in January. And all of the interactive parts have to go, like the chairs and the pillows have to go up on plinths so that they, people know that they're not to be sat in, which in a design <laughs> museum kind of makes sense, I guess. But it was, <laughs> it just reifies what it was, not what it, we wanted it to be. So um, it's sad, I, you know, I don't want the physical to go away. Um, I mean, I guess the antidote was there was a, there was a march in, in Brooklyn to um, kind of mark 4th of July as a way to honor um, black and indigenous people and all of the work they've done. They're the heroes and sheroes of our, um, of our collective Brooklyn landscape, whatever. And um, I made, I organized the making of these big fists and peace signs, these hands that come out of the poster. And I wasn't really that great yet. I wasn't really, didn't have that much energy yet, but I just did it with these other women. It was, and this one guy, we were just like, okay, let's do it. We've got four days. And we produced, I think, um, 50, these big things and it was like wow we did that in a short amount of time and it just came together and then I went over and slept for three days um, but I think it's that kind of thing it's like oh there's an opportunity to make something that's for good okay here we go masks on distanced you know don't touch the same stuff everybody's wearing gloves um, but I think I, those kind of projects seem right and it was the right kind of project for me it was like spearheaded by a um, black filmmaker whose name I'm forgetting right now, but it's just like a total powerhouse. It was, it was a great idea. Um, and it was like really, really keen kind of leadership with lots of, I guess film work, makers work in a totally different way. So there's like, there's this whole network place of people who do all sorts of things and they just show up to do things because they have their skills. So um, it's not very precious the way we might be as artists. <laughs> yeah, well, I would like to thank you for sharing your very precious time and um, <laughs> for speaking with me today. And I hope you get to rest and get some of that energy back. And I know that there are amazing projects on the way. So thank you very much. Thank you.